Greetings, welcome back to Environmental Epidemiology. Now for these next slides, we're gonna be discussing the history of coronaviruses, at least in terms of like the last 20 years. And we're gonna take some of that research that's been done largely in the veterinary public health and in the virology community, and then use that information for informing future presentations and future conversations that relate to the epidemiology of these viruses. Now with that said, I'm gonna switch over to the slides. Now it's first very important for us to realize that coronaviruses like the rhinoviruses, like influenza, like Ebola, like HIV, they are RNA viruses. And, and being RNA viruses, they are more easily mutable. They can be mutated more easily. They do not have the repair mechanisms. We know about DNA repair that exists in animal cells and bacteria and things like that, but RNA viruses are far more unstable. Now, what separates the coronaviruses from things like uh, the rhinoviruses is that the coronaviruses do have an envelope and that makes them more easily able to be impacted by soap and by washing our hands with soap, we are able to remove these things or by washing surfaces with soap or surfactants, we're more easily able to get these things off. Um, we can also do a better job of deactivating them. Certain things can disinfect surfaces, taking advantage of the fact that they have that envelope. Now, a big question that a lot of people may have is this next question that was the subject of a paper that was published in 2018. Why are RNA virus mutation rates so damn high? And this uh, publication by Dr. Duffy, who is a uh, professor, I believe, in ecology and evolutionary biology at Rutgers, um, she published this paper and, um, you know, got an outstanding young investigator award from the Virology Society on a lot of her other work. And uh, she said in her paper that coronaviruses, based upon other literature that she's been looking at, have a high mutation rate, not just coronaviruses, RNA viruses in general, have a high mutation rate up to a million times higher than their host. Coronaviruses may have a more rapid mutation rate than that, but in general, RNA viruses have a very high mutation rate. And this isn't just some fly-by-night publication. Uh, the Public Library of Science, or PLUS, and PLUS Biology has a high impact and it's a solid journal. In the paper, uh, she presents this figure that shows you the mutation rate per site per replication. And you can see that mutation events are very rare among animals. Things, and this is like using rodents. But as we start to move up to things like our viruses and we start moving up into RNA viruses, particularly small RNA viruses, this is a little image of the Ebola virus up there, we see a much more frequent mutation rate. So when we have diseases existing in animal populations that are RNA viruses, that's a potential problem that we need to be ready to deal with and need to be ready to deal with more going into the future. So there's a tremendous amount of diversity among coronaviruses. People act like, oh, well, we've seen these things all the time. There is broad receptor engagement of emerging global coronaviruses, and these things may potentiate their diverse cross-species transmissibility. This was published, I believe, you know, let's see, I'm going to have to look close at my screen here. I thought I had the source already pulled up in the year, but uh, yeah, this was uh, published um, in 2018, and actually Dr. Safe is the uh, corresponding author on it. So there's these different unique receptors on these viruses that give them the ability to get into different animals and maybe increase in number and then be spread to other things or just to be able to attach to things like us and our, our host cells when we inhale these things. Up here, we see that there's an example of these viruses infecting mink. 
And then we also have uh, the ability for them to infect things like ferrets. And that's not just the end of it. This paper discusses how they killed off a bunch of Canada geese. Uh, again, this is a goose coronavirus. As I start showing you these slides, we see porcine or pig, bat. Um, let's see, there's a myotis talking about bat again. These are bat, bat, ferret, mink. You can do murine, he's a mouse. Hedgehog coronavirus, Canada goose, avian, beluga whale coronavirus, night heron, widgeon, white eye. So we're getting into some of the aquatic birds here. So these are delta coronaviruses, alpha coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses. There's a variety of these different coronaviruses that are out there. Human coronaviruses kind of fit uh, into the beta coronaviruses. So there's a lot. We see MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that you all know about. Uh, SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. So SARS, um, as well as MERS, they're all beta coronaviruses, not too distant than the one that, like the human coronaviruses that we deal with routinely. So there's a tremendous variety of coronaviruses that exist in nature, but these ones are the ones that uh, theoretically are more closely related. But viruses um, can, you know, share genetic information, um, and things are a little bit messier when you're trying to do phylogenetic trees with RNA viruses compared to like doing things with animals or DNA viruses even. All right, so this group here called EcoHealth Alliance, which among those that kind of do One Health, there's like the One Health Initiative, there is the uh, One Health Commission, and then there's the EcoHealth Alliance. These are the three large players, and EcoHealth Alliance is probably the one with the most robust amount of science that kind of looks at the wildlife, livestock, environment interface with human life. And they present this in this big paper that they put together, and you can access this information uh, on their website, and I can share it with you if you really need it or you want to email me for it. You might be able to find it by just Google searching uh, phylogenetic analysis of novel Wuhan, China, human coronavirus. And when you look at it, you can see all these different coronaviruses that are more closely similar, but here is kind of the group that we're most interested in. I'll zoom in a little bit closer. The Wuhan human Chinese coronavirus, or China coronavirus to be more specific, um, has the closest affinity with some known bat coronaviruses. So you can see kind of these branches that show the relatedness. So these phylogenetic trees get a little bit messy, and there could be other viruses that are in here that we just didn't sequence. Now, when I say we, I'm talking about the scientific community that somebody didn't sequence. For every single one of these, somebody's had to actually um, find these viruses in nature or from a, a host in some way and then do the sequence so that we know about it. And because that work's already been done on some of these things, we are more quickly able to use some of the methods to figure out this virus. We figured out this novel coronavirus uh, in a really rapid time, and it was folks that were in the Chinese government and researchers in China, as well as researchers from around the world and from the World Health Organization uh, that really were on top of this. So. One of the most closely related viruses out there is this bat, SARS, coronavirus, and then RP3. And there's a way to measure RP3 in viruses. I'm not going to get into all the, the, the details of that. So if it, if it responds, I, I won't go into detail. I'll stop there. All right. So we have serological evidence of bat SARS related coronavirus infections in humans in China. So this paper is not all that. Old. So in 2015, that's when they did these studies, and this paper was published in 2018 in a virology journal, and they were looking at kind of an immune response to some of these SARS-related coronavirus infections. And 
it's important, you know, you can see the similarity in SARS, SR, coronavirus, roost. You know, see this here, very, very similar, right? So when they looked at people, they actually found in this particular area, this Jenin County, Yunnan province near these caves, some of the people actually had prior coronavirus infection. And in that study, uh, they did surveillance on people who lived in close proximity to caves where bats carry these different um, potential pathogens. And some of the folks had never recalled ever having SARS back in 2003. And they even looked to see if they were exposed to SARS 2003, or at least had serological or immune response to, to the SARS virus back in 2003, and they didn't see it. So they published this paper saying that yes, bats in some way could share or pass on SARS-related coronavirus infections to humans. Did it go directly from bat to human or bat to some animal or then to the human? We really don't know for sure. So what do we know about SARS-like viruses or viruses that are kind of in these groups? So we have MERS here and MERS, very similar to bat viruses, bat corona, many bat coronaviruses. We think that MERS probably started with a bat. When I say we, I'm talking about the scientific community. It went from a bat to a camel, and then from a camel or camels, where they may have amplified, to humans who may have close contact with camels. And then the potential for spread person to person and all that stuff we really worry about. But rooting the phylogenetic tree of MERS, they think it may have originated with an African bat. So that paper was published in 2014, but they also are not quite certain when that happened or if in fact that happened. Was there an intermediate? So for the most part though, they think it was involved with a bat. With SARS, the first SARS outbreak, the SARS in 2003 that I showed you the slide on the previous video that caused illness in Hong Kong and Canada, bat to civets. Some people call them civet cats and the civets then they think amplified the virus and after they amplified the virus then it made it more easily transmissible to humans and then it went human to human. With this particular virus, SARS coronavirus 2, that causes COVID-19 as the disease, we don't know for sure if there was an amplifying host. I had thought bats to pangolins, and I'm not the only one who had thought that. The World Health Organization and some people thought that because the initial readout from non-virologists was that there was some sort of report that there was sequence similarity of the pangolins, coronaviruses, and then when they even looked at the sick Malaysian pangolins, there were some, some similarities between pangolin coronavirus and SARS, you know, SARS coronavirus too. That's what we all thought. And then there were some people that thought maybe it went from bats and amplified in the actual pangolins that were at the wet or the seafood market that was also a wet market where they also sold animals in Wuhan. But we don't necessarily know for sure. And it's possible that it could have even went from human, from bats to humans, maybe in the village or in a cave area, and then they brought it to the market and it was human to human spread in Wuhan. We don't know. The WHO reported initially, and this has been about, oh, a month ago, um, actually getting up to a couple months ago. Well, we'll say a month ago, it's about a month ago. Um, yeah, definitely a month ago. They were saying the virus had a genome identity 96% similar to the SARS-like coronavirus um, and uh, 86 to 92% similar to pangolins. And they thought an animal source might be highly likely. And they then did RT-PCR 
on environmental samples, and they kind of made this determination that pangolins might be involved. However, when they started looking at other bats, they found higher sequence similarities, and uh, for what they were apparently looking at, SARS coronavirus has that particular sequence, they were, that spot in the genome, it's quite similar for a lot of other animals potentially as well. So it's kind of noisy. We still don't know for sure. So this was published not too long ago, just kind of a news article that summarizes some of the debate and some of the science that's being discussed. And it says mystery deepens over animal source of coronavirus. So they thought that pangolins were the prime suspect, but there are not any peer-reviewed papers. There are some that are in process of being published, but there are no peer-reviewed ones that say definitively, yes, the pangolins are the actual culprit. We do know this paper was peer-reviewed in the outstanding high-impact factor journal Nature that said that the pneumonia outbreak associated with the new coronavirus was a probable bat origin. So again, in this paper, they're also emphasizing pneumonia as being kind of the outcome that we really worry about. And this was published all the way back in January of 2020. And this is what showed the high, high sequence similarity between bat coronavirus and the novel coronavirus. So we have really, really strong reason to believe that bats are where this probably originated, but did it originate um, in the human population through a transmission event between bat and human, bat and some other animal host, and then the human where it was amplified in the animal, we just don't know. Uh, and then just, I mean, almost in like the last day, actually today as I'm, public, I'm writing this, um, this is scheduled for publication in the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association in April, but uh, they shared this new story that said a likely explanation of the origin of the COVID-19 virus is that it's a recombinant coronavirus from a bat coronavirus and another coronavirus and an intermediate animal host. They initially thought pangolins were that host, but viral sequencing indicated that that is likely not the case or isn't the case. So we don't know for sure if pangolins are responsible or not. So there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. One thing that we do know is that there is no credible evidence supporting any of the claims that there's been lab engineering of the SARS coronavirus. So there's a lot of questions that are still out there. And as we cover this more into the future, there are a lot of similarities and lessons we can learn from earlier uh, viruses everything even from HIV and Ebola, but especially SARS and MERS, as well as global pandemics. We still have to maintain an open mind. Uh, science ensures that uh, the truth probably lies on something that uh, we haven't quite discovered yet. And a scientific mind is an inquisitive mind, and we have to continue to keep all options and questions out there on the table but that we definitely need to follow the ones that have the most evidence. SARS, coronavirus 2, in a human-to-human -human fashion, though, does not appear to be mutating quickly. So that's promising news and gives us a little bit more hope, the likelihood of vaccines or drugs. But um, again, even the mutation rates of this virus and human-to-human -human spread, we still don't know for sure if that will continue to be the truth um, so that's, that's continuing to be kind of studied. There's also a lot to worry about or think about. We sometimes worry about reverse zoonoses. The initial evidence does not show any, uh, you know, kind of evidence that pets are really a potential um, place for us to share our pathogens in a reverse fashion, in a reverse zoonotic disease fashion to our pets. So. That we think is a good, or definitely if that's true, that's a good thing. So we're not likely to make our dogs get sick with something that could potentially be fatal or make our dogs sick and then our dogs or our cats then amplify the disease. But we don't know definitively for sure. So right now, from a risk perspective, the probability that pets get sick from humans is very, very low. 
but there is still a probability out there, and it may not be true for all animals. So some people have obscure pets at home, and it may not be true for things like pigs or who knows, raccoons or other things or ferrets. We don't know. So until people do the studies, we will not fully understand. All right, so we're gonna finish this up with some review questions, and uh, you should be able to answer these questions um, on your own. I'll put these slides up here. I might give you guys a quiz or um, a take-home assignment where you just answer these simple questions um, that exist over three pages or three slides. And then I'm going to jump to this last couple questions. What is the most common reservoir for the coronaviruses that cause pandemics, or at least cause pandemic coronavirus events? So what's the most common reservoir for the coronaviruses that cause uh, pandemic coronavirus diseases? I've got some typos in there I'd need to fix. So you should hopefully know the answer. And that would be bats. Now the next question is, why are bats always implicated? Why is it that bats carry or transmit all these diseases? And there are a few hypotheses that are out there. And one of them was published in that journal that Professor Gradio loves so much from the CDC. Doesn't necessarily mean that they all work at the CDC. Actually, you can see that these folks here don't work at the CDC. They work at a variety of different research uh, labs around the world. And the paper title, Bat Flight and Zoonotic Viruses. So there is some reason to believe that the reason why bat, bats are such a problem is because these huge temperature fluctuations that exist as they fly. So you can learn a lot more about them in the uh, paper. And then as I stop this video, um, I want to assure you that if you have any questions or comments, you can definitely email me or contact me. If you have my phone number, you can text me. And then if you're a little homesick for the uh, Disney building, there's a nice picture for you. So I hope uh, your time away from campus is productive. I know that there's a lot going on in the world, and we're going to do our best at the university to support you in any way that we can. So again... If you have any questions, uh, feel free to message me, and I'll do my best to respond. So thank you, and have a wonderful evening, or morning, or day, or night, whenever you're watching this. Have a good one.